From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And let me welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast. Perhaps this is your very first time. Well, if it is, let me give you an especially warm welcome. For the next 45 minutes or so today, we're going to be talking about a plant I happen to have a particular passion for, and that would be cannabis. Now, maybe you have a similar interest, and that could be why you're here. Before we get too much further, let me remind you, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction, and is intended purely for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. In episode 138, we have a conversation with Tyler Kibler, who is the new Director of Innovation for Canopy Growth in Canada. Very interesting conversation. Stand by for that. And part of that conversation will be an explanation of Seven Acres Burners, a new pre-roll that's hit the market. And the idea with this is you can sit back for a nice 15-minute smoke and enjoy every single minute of it. That's coming up on Cultivar Corner. Also, we're going to give you a link to the Marijuana Growing Cannabis Encyclopedia that I just got sent a link to, so I'll share that with you. I've been waiting for it. There have been more cannabinoids dropping into our cannabis market in Canada, and now Health Canada has decided it's time to put some limits on those. We've got that story from my friend David Wiley at theounce.ca. And here's something I've been hoping for. (laughs) We've talked about Sigma in relation to cannabis since the beginning of this podcast and since beginning of legalization. Still going on, one example was the exorbitant fees that cannabis stores had to pay for their business license. In the city of Kelowna, for example, (laughs) they were paying $9,500. That's about to change, too. All of that and more, let me see. I've got my bubble cush root beer ready to satisfy my thirst. I've got a joint ready to satisfy my imagination. I think we're ready. This is episode 138 of the Cannabis Podcast. If you are a regular listener of the Cannabis Podcast, you realize that on occasion I am wont to share some of my personal life, especially those moments that really matter. I came from the hospital tonight before recording this episode, and in the hospital is my brother Bill, so I'd like you to join me in giving Bill lots of good thoughts. He's going to get better. He's going to get through this, experiencing some of those things that many of us do as we get older, that unfortunately we can't control all of those things. He's in the hospital here in Kelowna. Oh, we got a chance to go see him today. My Both my boys, of course, Ian, who you well know. My other son, Sean, who I don't talk about as much, but I love him just as dearly. Both got a chance to go see Bill, and he really appreciated that. He's going to get through this. We love you, Bill. We want you to get better. There's got to be another opportunity for us to share a joint when you listen to the Cannabis Podcast. And now let's get to our first story of the day. And here is an opportunity for cannabis stores in at least Kelowna specifically to finally save a bit of money on their license fees. This is a story from a local news outlet called Castanet.net. Cannabis retailers in Kelowna have been paying some of the highest municipal business license fees in the province, but that's about to change. There are currently 18 licensed cannabis retail stores operating within the city of Kelowna, and each one has been paying an annual business license fee of $9,500, since cannabis was first legalized in 2018. This has been in stark contrast to the $650 annual fee a liquor retail store pays in the city, while most types of businesses pay $160. With his license up for renewal later this month, Dan Lapine, owner of Cannabis Corner Kelowna, reached out to Castanet last week to express frustrations with having to pay the exorbitant fee once again. But City of Kelowna Planning Director Ryan Smith says local cannabis retailers have paid their last four-digit business license fee. We're doing an update to the cannabis license bylaw, which is going to happen in January or February, but we're holding off on formal renewals of the $10,000 cannabis licenses, there's 18, until after we change the bylaw next year so that they'll pay the same fee as a retail liquor store, Smith said. We're not going to penalize people because we didn't get to it. We're going to hold off and not let them renew their licenses yet until we can charge them a lower fee. Many BC municipalities introduced very high cannabis business license fees back in 2018, when the drug was first legalized, to help recover costs associated with developing the new cannabis retail regime. We were into it for hundreds of thousands of dollars in staff time, Smith said. I think we were worried about more issues than actually occurred. The stores in town that are operating have been doing a good job, and we don't have the same concerns that we had at the beginning of the process. 
we don't need to have the same level of resource intensity put towards it. We originally were told by the provincial government that we were going to be reimbursed for our costs, but that never occurred. Most municipalities have already reduced their once-high cannabis business license fees. While Vancouver cannabis retailers were paying more than $30,000 for a business license five years ago, a license fare now costs $5,000. Last year, Kamloops Council slashed their fee from $5,000 to $196. Well, Vernon has brought its cannabis licensing fees in line with its liquor stores, ranging from $115 to $800 per year, based on size. And just last month, Nelson cut its cannabis business license fee from $2,500 to just $250. Kelowna's fee reduction is a long time coming, Smith told Castanet back in 2002, that the city was looking to reduce their fees. At the time, he said the city was pretty close to recovering the three hundred dollars to $400,000 cost of implementing the new cannabis retail regime. This is one of the areas of stigma that really bugs me because clearly there were not the problems that they thought there were going to be. That's why they were charging the exorbitant fees. Let's be honest. They were charging them the exorbitant fees because they thought they were going to be nasty businesses and turn the areas of town into nasty areas of town. That just didn't happen. And I'm glad to finally see that they're seeing the light at the end of that tunnel. And people who own the cannabis stores can finally save some money on their licensing. And now let me introduce you to Tyler Kibler. Tyler, in his LinkedIn profile, says, Innovator, Farmer, and Free Thinker. Well, Tyler also just recently got a promotion. He works at Canopy Growth, and he is their new Director of Innovation. Tyler and I had a chance to have a conversation the other day. Great conversation about some innovations happening in the Canadian cannabis market, one of which, which includes the Seven Acres Burner, a new special kind of pre-roll that was a very interesting smoke. We started our conversation when I asked Tyler to tell me how his cannabis journey began. Why don't we start, Tyler, with your cannabis history? How did how did you come to this wonderful plant? Oh, uh, that's a great story and background, I guess. Like I've always, uh, you know, been interested in the plant ever since I was a young adolescent, kind of, you know, doing the fun things we shouldn't be doing. Uh, and then closer into college, uh, it just kind of dawned on me at a few friends that I met that were growing uh, cannabis and kind of, you know, making more of a business of it, I guess, at the, at that time when I moved to a big city. And uh, shortly after college, I uh, met my lovely wife and her goal was to um, get a job right out of university in the, uh, the cannabis space, which uh, unbeknownst to me was becoming legal at that point in time. I wasn't really paying attention to that part of the the world. Um, so then in, I think this is in about 2014, um, we moved to BC and my wife uh, got her first job at a university with um, an MMAR grower out in uh, in Maple Ridge there. And uh, I ended up designing uh, a couple products for them, um, a plant transporter that one of the uh, big LPs somehow saw on a deck somewhere and uh, my wife was actually working for them at the time, and they asked her uh, if, if she knew anything about this just randomly. And she said, yeah, my, my husband actually designed that thing. He owns the rights to it. Kind of long story short, I ended up uh, getting a job with uh, with Aurora back in 2017 and kind of really kick-started into the, the legal cannabis space at that point in time. In your role as Director of Innovation for Canopy Growth, which you just moved into, uh, you're kind of fresh in that role? Or are you still pretty excited and, and, and just can't oh, yeah. wait to, to put all those innovations to, to work? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a daunting task uh, to have such a diverse portfolio and kind of picking and choosing where we need to play and uh, what we need to do to, to win as an organization. But it's uh, it's unique, right? Like cannabis seems to be as as old as the plant is and how you know people have been using it for thousands of years there's still just new innovative stuff that's still yet to be done and things that are coming in from other countries that we're learning from so it's a it's a neat space it's like it's, it's incredible actually but yeah it is it, it's a fascinating space to be in so what's the exciting factor for you for you in that title of, of working on these new innovations and, I, and again i understand that you can't share a, a bunch of what you're doing because proprietary and all that yeah but share as much as you can in terms of the excitement of what you're doing right now 
Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, maybe I'll take a, a small step back. Like what really got me so excited, I guess, on the innovation side of things is, uh, you know, back in 2018, before extracts were, were kind of totally legal, right? We had oils and soft shells and stuff, but you couldn't have vaporizers and edibles until 2019. Um, my innovation brain kind of went off and I was chatting with some regulatory folks and we we found a bit of a loophole that, uh, you know, we can make a vape cart that uh, was child safe and had a little, you know, push down and screw turn lid on it. And we could we could sell that under the current regulations uh, as long as it wasn't attached to a battery. Uh, so, you know, long and behold, we uh, we, we sold the uh, first vape pen uh, legally the day before uh, the 2019 regulations came in. And uh, that kind of like thinking um, outside the box and kind of, you know, really understanding the regulations helped me just realize what the options are, right? Like not everything is black and white. Um, everything is kind of up for interpretation and there's always different ways to do different things. So that kind of like really just drove my head around like, wow, there's so much more possibilities that things that we can do. Um, so now I've really worked hard to to find different partners because that's one of the big things, right? Like I can't come up with all the cool ideas by myself. So I have to find other people that also have cool ideas and either maybe need some help getting that to the market or, or just have, you know, contract manufacturers that have a cool piece of technology that they, that they live and breathe and, and are very good at what they do. And they need someone to, you know, take that product and market it and put it onto the market. So that was one of our, unique ones that i like this year we came out with um, the seven acres uh smooth burners it's a very interesting pre-roll like the pre-roll hasn't really changed in many many years right it's always kind of a cone people roll their own and stuff of course me myself i couldn't roll a joint if my life depended on it i was never a joint roller i was always kind of a bong person myself and um and many people were absolutely tired that that's a lot of people's world the joints never came into it so yeah. on the burners i'm, I'm yeah, gonna, yeah. gonna pause no. you there because I'm, I'm gonna take a little bit of step back and in fact what i found really interesting in fact i was i was describing this to my family over dinner tonight when i described it as being you know roughly five to six inches long and you know about a quarter inch eighth inch around and and half of its filter and half of its weed and and my wife said that must burn really fast and i said well <laughs> interesting you say that because the whole point is it burns slowly and and i can attest after having you teach me the proper way to light it yes it burned solidly and was a beautiful smoke for 15 minutes you did oh. marvelously. Can you explain a little bit about, about how that's achieved? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I can't take all the, the, the glory of this, but uh, we found a, a CMO partner of ours that uh, has this kind of technology and the patent uh, around to, to make this type of a pre-roll. So, of course, you know, like the pre-rolls are pretty standard. Everyone just puts weed into their, their rolling paper and they either roll it up or you stuff a cone. Um so nothing's really ever changed, right? You, you you light the end of it and you smoke travels all the way through the weed and you keep burning it until it's gone. What's unique about this burner, the this technology is they put a hole down the center of the pre-roll and they've structured it and they kind of like create the technology so that it forms itself nice and dense. And after it's manufactured, it keeps that hole down the center of the, of the pre-roll all the way to the filter, of course. And what that does is it allows the smoke to travel down the center hole um, unobstructed instead of traveling through the biomass or through your cannabis, which is traditionally how you know pre roll works, right? You smoke the you smoke it, the smoke comes through the weed. By the time you get you know halfway through the joint, the weed's kind of uh, dilapidated. There's no real terpenes left. You've kind of already pre burnt them off really before you get get to it as you're actually smoking it. Where in this fashion the the smoke traveling down the center hole, kind of like a chimney, uh, doesn't do that, right? So the the weed tastes the same all the way through the through the smoking experience. And I know the filters look kind of funny because it does look odd. You know, forty percent of it's a filter and sixty percent of it's weed. It's very long. People ask a lot of questions of why is the filter so long? This is so weird. We find that just like uh, you know, all new technology it takes a little bit for people to get used to and get com comfortable with and familiar with. Um, but it's purposeful. The, the filter is so long because it also helps um, cool down the smoke as, as it brings it to you. So we find that it gives you a very pleasant experience. It's not too hot, not too cold. You can't take 
great big drags off of it like you know you could maybe on a big blunt or something but again that's purposeful so that each toke is just like the last one basically right um yeah yeah it, it, very innovative i i truly enjoyed the experience i'm curious tyler the discussions that led up to the development of the burner like like what was the initial discussion that that, that you were first involved in and, and what was the initial idea that somebody had that, that you brought to fruition yeah, like um, just like any other you know, cannabis smoker, right? Uh, some folks reached out to us actually via LinkedIn. Because LinkedIn is one of the you know the more famous cannabis friendly social media platforms for uh, for cannabis people to connect. Uh, so we got we got uh, so they reached out to us on LinkedIn and said, "Hey, we have this real cool thing we need you to see and, and try out. It's, you know, the n- newest and greatest pre roll." And of course, you're a little bit skeptical, right? Like, I'm just like, how how much cooler can a pre roll get, right? Like, <laughs> pre rolls a pre roll, like, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so true. We met up with the, with these folks. Uh, they're actually also based out here in Alberta, and uh, and then they they kind of you know we have dinner. And they're talking about how cool this thing is and how it's like nothing like we've ever seen, and how nice it's gonna burn, and how each size, like even if it's the small ones, like you had. Um, our 0.7 is kind of, you know, small and nimble, like a cigarette all the way to like great big blunts that the exact same technology is kind of staggered in the, in the sizes. So it, and it still burns just as nice, just as smooth, just as consistently, um, which is like hard to believe, right? Like you, you're usually like, well, the bigger you get, the harder it is. And the, you know, kind of worse the experience is generally. And by the time you get the end, the more like gummy and resin it is and all that fun stuff. Um, so yeah, you know, they kind of put on a nice little show for us. And then finally we're like, okay, well, let's see these things. Right. Um, so then we kind of go back to an Airbnb and there were beautiful display. They had all different kinds of sizes uh, that you could imagine um, that you would see a traditional pre-roll in, right. All the way up to can of gars, a nice old leaf wrapped and just real cool looking stuff. And then, uh, you know, it was time for the show to go on. So we started lighting them up and trying them out and, as sure enough, there was about six of us, you know, smoking all these different various sizes, some that are infused with hash and keef and diamonds and some are rolled in blunt paper and stuff like that. But it was what I found was super interesting about the whole ordeal is we, we, we were probably smoking these things and passing them around and talking to each other for about two hours. And during the entire two hours that we were there, not one of us coughed. And it was just, it was the weirdest thing. Like usually someone's coughing in the, in the smoke circle, right? Like it's, and I was just like, why is no one coughing here? And why like, you know, we're all feeling very pleasant at the moment, right? Like we've been doing this for a while, but uh, it just kind of struck me as odd. I was like, you know what? I think they got something here. Like this is, this is different and it's a nice and enjoyable experience. Uh, different doesn't always mean it's the best and the greatest thing like there's still a lot of education that needs to be done if you can imagine one pre-roll out of 400 on the shelf and it's the one that's quite a bit different takes a little bit of finesse to light and so it's still a learning curve in terms of the educational piece and kind of getting people bought into the whole you know story but um yeah i was just you know kind of blown away i was like you know what these guys weren't bullshitting me and they were like yeah this is new and innovative free roll like never thought of i could even picture it in my own head right yeah but, yeah it's very cool technology i quite enjoyed quite enjoyed the smoke any other innovations in the pocket that you're working on now that uh, you're pretty excited about oh there are quite a few i would say in the vape the, the vape world um we have quite a few vapes kind of launching in between february and april uh, unfortunately as exciting as they are they're not launched yet so i can't publicly speak about the franchise but I do have one pretty neat product that we launched uh, in PEI as, of all places at the beginning, just because it uh, it timed well with their uh, their holiday uh, launch there. So we we launched a product called uh, Seven Acres Smokehouse Hash, um, and what it is is we actually, um, you know, we we pressed hash and created a nice uh, gummy hash uh, using uh, a little bit of bubble hash and keef. And then mm-hmm. one of our guys on the floor who, who's kind of our engineer and, and hash guy, he kind of came up with an idea and he says, why don't we try smoking this stuff in a, um, in a kitchen smoker um, and add a bit of flavoring to it, right? <laughs> like everyone's adding these botanical terpenes and all kinds of flavoring yeah. agents to get like, you know, candy and bubble gum and all this stuff. And we thought, you know, 
may, that might be a cool idea. Maybe that you know it's more natural. It's it's something people yeah. know new know and use, right? So we tried it out, and um, it would actually it tasted really good. So we we ended up you know smoking it for about an hour at very low temperature, just enough to uh, to to get the aroma basically infused in the hash. And we we started sure. with hickory. We we're doing a rotational skew, so uh, we got plans to do like maple and cherry uh in the future but uh it, it ended up doing really well it's um it's consistently the top three uh selling skew in the, in pei at the moment with the uh with their holiday special that is really cool yeah, it's just it's yeah i like the we idea never would have thought about right like you're no no like <laughs> those weird combinations like that that ended up you know tasting good kind of it's niche um and so it's also launching in alberta here. I, think, uh, I think it's landing in the next week or two it'll be available and then we'll roll it out to see in Ontario. But stoners do have very innovative ideas when you listen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when you listen and you got a group of stoners together, absolutely. <laughs> Somebody has to be listening and perhaps writing it down so you remember the next morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that brings up an interesting question, Tyler. You talk about different provinces. What's the difficulty for an organization like yours in, in looking at all these different provinces and bringing these different products to market? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question because I'm sure the the general population and, and folks don't think about this at all, right? Um, each province has its own unique set of regulations on top of the federal regulations, and each province has its own way that they purchase products and that they have listing windows, right? So the OCS has four listing windows a year. The listing windows are about six months ahead of the time from when the product launches, from when you, you basically pitch the assortment of pro products to them. Um, so you have to kind of be, you know, planning further in the future, of course, of, of what you're planning to, you know, have in market come, uh, come six from six months from now, but every province is on its own schedule. So you can't just plan like, okay, you know, we have this, where we have this plan in January, we're going to launch in June. It's always like, well, that works for Ontario. Uh, Quebec has two windows a year that they take. And sometimes if it's very new and innovative product, they'll take it outside the listing window, but not all the time. And then sometimes they have their own sub things that they have going on that they're trying to like boost their market with. And then there's places like BC, BC is probably one of the easier provinces to work with because they have kind of a, an open window and they'll, they'll accept pitches every two to three weeks, basically. Um, but they want your product right away. Like when, after you pitch it, you need to be able to supply the product within six weeks. So it's kind of like you need to have your stuff together and like, you know, already basically making the product. Alberta is kind of similar to Ontario. They have multiple pitches per year. They, they broke theirs up into categories. So there's only a, uh, I think there's about four all category pitches and then there's um, three pitches uh, basically after that, that's subcategories. So like vapes and extracts at one point in time and then edibles and beverages and stuff like that. So Alberta is also a little bit more flexible. And then there's Manitoba and Saskatchewan, which are direct to retail and it's a whole different ball game. They also will take stuff at, at any given time, but you have, you're not pitching it to a provincial board anymore. You're pitching it directly to, to retailers, um, which, you know, there's, 20 or 30 different retailers in those two provinces alone. So you're kind of having 20 or 30 different conversations and it's, and the Atlantic Canada has also, you know, got their own kind of schedule of when they take products and which products they're willing to take. And it's just such a dynamic market. It's not just, you know, one product fits everybody. Um, each province kind of has their own wish list at any given time, certain things they like, like, BC is really more forward with 510 carts and versus like all in one vapes uh, where other provinces are a little more open to all in one vapes because they want the consumer to, to kind of own that experience, um, which is kind of the difference between 510s and all in ones. I know, you know, not the greatest thing for the environment and stuff, but you can control the consumer experience much better with an all in one vaporizer, which is kind of why they're successful uh, versus a 510 cart you have you know no idea which battery you have you own versus the one i own or the one we tested with <laughs> and will it work yeah and yes and will it work is it what temperature or what wattage is your battery going to is it a single wattage or is it three watts like anyway i know we're kind of like derailing off the provincial thing but yeah working with the provinces um 
it's it's a tricky finesse and luckily uh we have lots of sales people that are kind of very regional so they know they know their region well they kind of know what those retailers in that province wants and uh, it's it's just a very dynamic ever changing yeah and and as you say so diverse across our con- country have you ventured into quebec at all yes absolutely yeah like uh this is all public knowledge like the quebec listing window is uh is open right now and i think it was um the the pitch was actually last week for uh for an april launch basically of their products uh, quebec is again a very different market than the rest of canada right they have a 30 percent potency cap so whether you're a dried flower or a, well they won't even take vape pens but if now they're accepting infused pre-rolls and and concentrates but you're limited to 30 percent thc which is very difficult right like if you're doing live resins and live rosins typically you're you know 60 to 80 percent thc so now you're kind of diluting it with cbd or doing unique things to bring that potency down to 30 percent but still have a nice consumer experience so quebec's kind of its own like little interesting i've always thought it was yeah. yeah. And that just seems so odd to me that I, I can understand the 30% THC cap. If, if you're going to do that, okay, I can get that. But, but what I don't get it, you're putting that cap on and yet you're still in, allowing infused in. W- what do you expect to achieve with the infused if it's not above 30%? Yeah, right. You, you got a 29% flower pre-roll and a 29% infused pre-roll, right? The only difference is one is flavoring in it probably or something, right? Like, yeah. And, and have you found that, uh, Tyler, as you look across the country, the different provincial organizations, are they putting certain demands in, in terms of those THC levels out there? Really, other than Quebec is the only one that kind of has that 30% potency barrier. There's some, the rest of them don't put. I guess on the other side, I'm wondering is is if there are those that want a certain level of THC. Yes, of oh, you, that is very true. Yeah, so typically each province kind of has its own like list of what they're looking for for a certain pitch window and some of them might be you know high thc which is nowadays high thc is like over 30 percent and they call low thc is like 15 to 20 percent which is crazy um but they kind of really break it down for you in terms of like typically what their ask is and then like where there might be still openings in their market right i feel like they they do a good job of not really being too restrictive because, you know, if they always just ask for one thing, then everyone's kind of like, now you're stifling innovation to some degree, right? You're kind of stifling genetics and stuff. Now everyone's just breeding for high THC. And so they're pretty good, at least about kind of opening the window further from what they're generally asking for. But you'll see like a lot of them uh, right now, are kind of diverting back and be like, Hey, now we don't have any CBD products on the market because everyone's driving high THC for the last year and a half. So maybe we'll open the door back out for balanced strains and for CBD positive strains. So we're kind of seeing a, a shift back into product calls asking for lower THC products or balanced products, which is, which is nice to see. Um, of course they still have a, pretty large window for high THC products because that seems to be what sells today. But um, it's nice to see that at least like about six to eight months ago, they like if you pitched a one to one strain or something that was like 17 to 22%, you were pretty unlikely to get it. But now it, now they're kind of opening their eyes that not everyone needs to be, you know, completely stoned out of their tree. Some of us <laughs> like do things while we're high and kind of like enjoy the experience. Yeah. Yeah, and, and some have realized that they don't need those thirty percent to achieve what, what they're trying to get, anyways. So, <laughs> that yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion. You've 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 opened my eyes to a whole bunch of things about the the industry works, the the whole concept behind the burners, the innovation behind that. I don't know if you're ready for it, but it's time for my hot seat questions. Oh yeah, and I think you're probably capable of them. So, simple question: the first one is um, your favorite cultivar. My favorite cultivar, my favorite cultivar, and I'm not even sure it's available by this breeder, but um, Planet of the Grapes by Hearst Organics. Um, you used to be able to get it through the, um, one of the medical folks that are out in Saskatchewan there. I think they uh, recently sold their stuff to Mendo, but it was a 16% THC strain with 4.5% terps, and it just tasted like a bag of grapes. Like, you open the bag and you just got 
hit in the face with grape. And it was just a very nice, lovely smoke. You weren't too high, but it tasted just beautiful. Oh, sounds delightful. Yeah, uh, do you prefer of, joints it, or vape? Uh, vape, because I can't roll joints, but I will buy joints. Okay, you'll buy <laughs> joints. There's a lot of people who buy joints. And yeah. thank goodness there are the retailers would be in a whole different situation in our country right now. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Oh. Do you have a favorite munchie, Tanner? A, a, a favorite munchie? Oh, that's, you know, funnily enough, one of my favorite munchies is grapes because they're just like, <laughs> they get you over that the kind of apropos. and stuff, right? And like you're get a little bit juicy <laughs> and you can just, you can eat a whole bag of grapes and not feel like, you know, yeah. bad about yourself. <laughs> uh, edibles or flour? Uh, that's a good one. I would say edibles honestly i'm not my wife is much more of a flower person than i am um since i left college i just haven't been hitting the bong as much so i very much into to vapes and and <laughs> pre-rolls made by other people <laughs> <laughs> yeah i get it and uh so and I, I asked this question from people all across the country just to see if i get some different answers and that's regarding uh what do you call three and a half grams of cannabis do you have a do you have a word or a term that you use for that Oh, a three and a half gram, or we used to call them uh, not an eighth because that's a, a new lingo. But we used to, like what we used to call them like it was like a quarter, a half quarter, which is like the weirdest name in the world. You are from Ontario? Yeah, yeah, I'm originally from Ontario. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a half quarter. <laughs> yeah, it's what. Yeah, exactly. And I, when I was a kid, I was like, why are we asking for a half quarter? Like this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> the first time I heard it, I was working at uh, at a store here in BC. And somebody came in and said, can I get a half quarter or something? I went, what? What? I said, well, a half quarter. I said, well, that would be an eighth. <laughs> and so then I, li I like to joke that in Ontario, they never took fractions far enough. So they should no. have determined that it was an eighth. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what it was, too. Where we just stopped at a quarter. Well, I want half of that quarter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, lovely conversation, Tyler. Thanks so much for uh, spending some time with me. I really appreciate it. As to the people listening to the Cannabis Podcast, any final words? No, I appreciate you having me. And like, I've been a, a lo lo long time listener of this, at least for the last six months. And just like, I love what, you, what you're doing, spreading the cannabis news to the masses in a, in a nice, comfortable way. Just you keep doing what you're doing. You have a beautiful podcast. I appreciate that, Tyler. You enjoy the rest of your night. Yeah, thank you very much. Take care. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And we're going to go to the outs.ca for our next story. This is written by my buddy David Wiley. CBN, THCV, among those hit with Health Canada limits. As cannabis producers flirt with higher amounts of minor cannabinoids in their products, such as CBN, the federal government is firing a warning shot. Health Canada says cannabis producers should be applying the same standard to different intoxicating cannabinoids as they do for THC. That means, for example, the total amount of CBN and THC added together can't exceed the 10 milligram cap per edible or beverage. CBN, which is becoming increasingly popular in edibles, is among Health Canada's list of targeted cannabinoids, as well as Delta-8 THC and THCV. All have shown evidence of binding to and activating the CB1 receptors. For cannabis consumers, this means even tighter restrictions and further limitations to the kinds of products they'll see in stores. While CBG and CBC are also being increasingly marketed in edibles, they are so far exempt. We may revise this list as new evidence becomes available about these and other potential intoxicating cannabinoids, says the Federal Department's recently issued guidance document. There's evidence that CBN has a sedating effect. Some of the popular products currently in the Canadian legal cannabis space that include CBN are pearls and spinach gummies, as well as Kiva chocolates. They're often subtly touted as sleep aids. We understand that not all intoxicating cannabinoids may cause the same level or type of effects as Delta-9 THC, says Health Canada. However, we don't have enough evidence to fully understand the effects of these other intoxicating cannabinoids relative to Delta-9 THC either alone or in combination with others. The government says that deliberately including intoxicating cannabinoids to cannabis products to circumvent regulatory controls could increase health and safety risks. As for compliance and enforcement, Health Canada says, 
We strongly encourage licensed processors to follow the recommended specific controls for cannabis products, deliberately made with intoxicating cannabinoids other than Delta-9 THC. It adds, Health Canada asks licensed processors to undertake actions to address public health and public safety risks or non-compliance with the Act and the regulations. However, we may take enforcement measures, if required, in order to mitigate the risks to public health or public safety. And there you go. The minor cannabinoids now under the telescope of Health Canada. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. Go to the corner. Oh, yeah. Go to the corner. Please explain this stuff to me. We're always looking for innovation in the cannabis industry, especially when we go to think about what we're going to do for Cultivar Corner. And I've definitely expressed my opinion about pre-rolls and the fact that from a cost perspective, they're not your most economical way to consume cannabis. But putting that aside, there are some reasons to consider pre-rolls. The product that I have in my hands today is a rather unique entry into the pre-war world into the pre-roll world. It's early in the morning. That's why I'm not speaking clearly. <laughs> I got my hands on one of these from Seven Acres, and this is what they're calling the burners. The package comes with 3.7 gram pre-rolled cannabis joints. And let's talk about this pre-rolled cannabis joint because it looks like nothing that I've seen before. In terms of the, the, the format... The filter seems to be as long as the piece that has the weed in it. <laughs> I got a piece that's probably about four or five inches long. Really, really nicely tight. It's very thin. The idea behind the burner is they claim that this is going to burn smoothly and completely for 15 minutes. So, you know, I don't know if you've ever smoked a cigar back in the day when I used to smoke tobacco. There was the occasional time I'd pull out a cigar and just kind of sit back and enjoy the smoke for a few minutes. Well, the burner from Seven Acres is giving us cannabis users an opportunity to do the same thing, because that's the point. It's supposed to last for a 15-minute burn. Now, as I often do in Cultivar Corner Reviews, I see where I can find the information, and I had a lot of trouble finding information about the Seven Acres burners. On the Seven Acres site itself... All I could find that even mentioned burners was a video that shows me how to light the burner. <laughs> now, did I need instructions on how to light a joint? After 50 years of cannabis consumption, one would think not, but apparently <laughs> innovation is coming to the market. And as part of this innovation, again, you look at this thing and you think there's no way that's going to last for 15 minutes. How you light it is very, very important. And what we have to do is we have to light it off to the side with the flame on it until we get a good red cherry in the end. So that's where we're going to go. Now, let me give you some of the details. Now, I will also say I don't have a lot of details. I couldn't find a lot of details on the web uh, through a search of Google and all various other forms. So most of the information is going to come from the little tube that I have in my hand. So Seven Acres Burners, it's an indica. Perhaps not a good idea to do first thing in the morning, but that's never stopped me before. <laughs> And what do I have? I have THC of 26.9 and Terps 2.16. Uh, it is rock or alien rock candy is the strain. And the lineage of that is Sour Dupel and Tahoe Alien. Flavors are fruit, citrus, and sage. And the drying method was hang dried, which is always a good thing. So there's 3.7 grams in the tube that you get. The burner so. Let's give it a try. So the instructions for lighting it, got to hold a flame on the end, off to the side, and keep that flame on the end until we see a nice red glow. So I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, doing my proper methodology. Oh, it looks like I got a nice red glow there now. Wow, that really burns. I'm amazed at how well that burns on the end. And there it is, nice red glow. And now a nice, smooth smoke. That's the beauty of it. This, if it lives up to its marketing, is going to be here for me to smoke any time over the next 15 minutes, as I so desire. 
Now, chances are we're not going to have the cultivar corner go for the entire 15 minutes until I finish the burner. <laughs> that might be a bit excessive. But we will talk about what it's like getting there. A nice smooth smoke so far. Um, feels good in your hand. That filter is a nice stiff filter on top of where the weed is. And again, I can't, I still can't imagine this is going to go for 15 minutes looking at how, how thin this joint is. Come back to it. Take a nice pull. Nice and even. No harshness. A nice even draw. So no plug on that. And I continue to come back to it. And every time I do, it's a nice draw. Not a lot of work to pull off of this joint. Now, is a Saturday morning the best time to do a burner? <laughs> I'm sure there are those that could debate that point. <laughs> and might suggest that a Saturday evening or a Saturday night might be a better option. <laughs> for this 29 or 26.9 percent TAC indica <laughs> but I've never been one to do things the way things are supposed to be done because after all if I'm doing a cultivar corner I've got to do that the first thing in the day so you get a true representation of what it does so here we go and what's the effect so far I'm really impressed with how Slowly, that is burning. I have no idea of what the innovation is that allows that to happen. And maybe we'll get a chance to find out about some of that innovation. But impressive so far. Oh, and I'm starting to feel some of that effect too. Yep, here comes a little touch of happy eyes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Euphoria kind of rising to the surface. <sighs> Again, don't try to talk when you got smoke in your mouth, Gary. <laughs> Which is a difficult thing for somebody doing a cultivar corner. I find it interesting the way the universe works. <laughs> At the beginning of this presentation, I talked about the fact that this burner was intended to go for about 15 minutes and that we likely would not be able to deal with the entire consumption of that over the course of a cultivar corner because that would take 15 minutes. <laughs> well, the furnace in the studio at Cannabis Podcast <laughs> decided to play its part in this journey and it turned on and I continued to smoke it. So there has been a period of about six minutes in the middle of this where I continued to smoke this burner. And I have to tell you, Every single time I go to it and take a hit, it's still there. It is burning incredibly well, incredibly slowly. I, I want to find out the innovation of how they managed to do this, because this is burning incredibly slowly. And no joint I have ever rolled has lasted this long. <laughs> and on top of that, I'm getting pretty buzzed. In those interim minutes when I continue to smoke it, and continue to smoke it now, each of those puffs adds a little bit more to my endocannabinoid system, giving me a bit more of a high. Mm -mm. Quite enjoying it. Now, was it a good decision to do a long, heavy joint of indica <laughs> and to start your morning? Maybe not. I might be rethinking that one a little bit later as I lay down for a nap. <laughs> You never know how that's going to go. In fact, this is a busy day today. I am off to help my son Ian, who you all know, of course. Um, he's taking his driver's test today. He's ready to do it, and we're going to go out for a little run before I drop him off at the driver application place. So, seven acres burner. If you're looking for something to just ease yourself into a night, or you want to kick back... You could share it, too. It doesn't have to be a solo smoke. It would work really well to pass along. And probably, with multiple people going, it would likely still go for that 15-minute burn. So, I haven't reached the end of it. 
And again, in terms of the cumulative time that this has been burning, it is probably darn close to that 50-minute mark now. So they have achieved their goal. The seven acres burner, 26.9% THC on a 0.7 gram joint. A new kind of innovation. Not sure how they managed to do it, but they have. It's been a really nice smoke for a really long time. <laughs> I think I'm going to have a good day. And as I am often want to do, <laughs> a bit of a follow-up. After I've been sitting here and this has been rolling around in my endocannabinoid system for a while, ah, it's really nice. <laughs> yes, it is a heavy indica, really deep body relaxation, just loving the way my body is feeling right now. A bit of a headstone as well, that's not totally ignored, but definitely has moved well into the body. Ah, this is going to be a real nice day. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And today I want to share with you a link that was shared with me. And this is from a gentleman that I'm sure many of you have heard before, Jorge Cervantes. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. My Spanish is not really good. But Jorge has a tremendous reputation and built the Cannabis Encyclopedia. And he's published an up-to-date edition. And it's all accessible through the link that you will find back on the show page for the Cannabis Podcast. If he's going to share it, I'm going to share it with you too. And here's just the note from the, from the homepage. Welcome to the Cannabis Encyclopedia, your ultimate guide by Jorge Cervantes. Hey there, fellow grower and cannabis lover. Dive right into the heart of the Cannabis Encyclopedia, a labor of love and decades of research. From the intriguing tastes of medical cannabis to the latest hacks in indoor growing, I've got you covered. And the cherry on top? I'm sharing all this gold with you on MarijuanaGrowing.com for free. And as I said, the link is included. You can find it at CannabisPodcast.com or on the show page, which is with the show notes. Great idea, Jorge. Thanks for sharing the details. And of course, once again, let me thank you for being a listener. I truly appreciate the fact that you are here. also want to thank my sponsors, Kevin and Jordana at BuyMeACoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast. If you feel so inclined and you like what you hear, you're welcome to go there too and you can buy me a doobie. also want to thank my patrons at Patreon, Tony and Roger. Also, getting ad-free episode access, Gage and Rob. Thanks so much for the support. I truly do appreciate it. And now let's end with another humorous thought. Apparently, smoking cannabis can affect your short-term memory. Well, if that's true, what do you think smoking cannabis does? That's it for episode 138 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the cannabis-infused studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Season one of Dope History is now available at dopehistory.com. Dope History weaves you through the lives of those who have been touched by cannabis or have had an influence on the events that shaped our laws or relationships with this plant. You'll hear tales from Frenchie Cannoli, Keith Strop, Eddie Lepp, Tom Alexander, Ed Rosenthal, Wolf Seagull, Jorge Cervantes, and Tommy Chong. Available now at dopehistory.com.